you ever just start digging into a little math and then you find something that kind of blows your mind. Now, I have not done one of these in a while. Camera versus phone. But I've been getting really tired of other reviewers still acting like phones are only worth it for the lowest level, bare minimum point and shoot photography. We are in a beautiful camera renaissance right now, both on the mirrorless side and on the phone photography side. The very first time I staged one of these comparisons, I really didn't have the tools to properly balance out all of the multiple differences between phones and cameras, the equivalent focal lengths, apertures, etc., etc., etc. I've gotten a bit better equipped over the years. So to handle this showdown, I'm comparing two systems that I really do use to get my work done. The camera side will be shooting micro four thirds and the phone side will be represented by the Vivo X70 Pro Plus. Now, the camera I've chosen is the Lumix G9. This is my current workhorse camera. 20 megapixel sensor with roughly 3.3 micron pixels. Fantastic build quality, professional features, and generally one of the most cost effective ways to start shooting higher quality 4K video. Buying just the body, we're looking at a starting price of $1,100. The X70 Pro Plus is a camera focused beast of a phone with the wonderful Samsung GN1 sensor. And when it's been down to 12 megapixels, we're looking at roughly 2.4 micron pixels. Price for the whole phone is roughly 12 to $1,400 MSRP, depending on region, sales, and storage configurations. Now, why am I so giddy to compare these two cameras. Well, when we look at crop factors and equivalent performance, we see that Vivo has done something really clever and I love it. <laughs> Let's get nerdy with some numbers. When we compare cameras, we talk a lot about equivalent performance. We try to compare everything against how it would look to shoot on a full frame 35 millimeter camera. If you take a 50 millimeter lens and you put it on a micro four thirds camera body, it's going to look like you're shooting on a 100 millimeter lens on a full frame body. Micro four third camera has a crop factor of two. So you multiply the focal length of any lens by two to see how it would roughly compare against a full frame camera. This also runs true generally for aperture. If you multiply the aperture by the crop factor, you get a close approximation of how the depth of field might resemble a full frame camera. And I did this in my last Sony camera review. Shooting on an f1.4 lens on my Lumix looked pretty close to shooting f2.8 on a Sony full frame. I've got this beautiful Lumix G9 on it. I've got my 12 to 60 kit lens. This is about a $400, $500 lens. For shooting on this wide open, that's 12 millimeters at f3.5 crop factor of two. It's gonna be similar to a full frame camera at 24 millimeters and F7, that's groovy. But what about the phone? This Vivo has one of the biggest sensors available on any phone and one of the fastest apertures available at this sensor size. About a 23 millimeter equivalent at f1.6. When we look up the real focal length of the lens, we see it's actually a 6.5 millimeter lens. That means we're using a crop factor of around 3.5. Okay, this is what's annoying about the way that we talk about phone cameras. We mix and match numbers for better marketing. We use the equivalent focal length, about 23 millimeters, alongside the actual aperture of f1.6. That really confuses the conversation. And I think it also makes it easier to disregard phone upgrades because we're playing fast and loose with different kinds of math. But since we know the crop factor is about 3.5, we can multiply that by the aperture to get the approximate equivalent aperture. How would this compare against a full frame camera? At a 23 millimeter equivalent, the Vivo is sporting the equivalent aperture of f5.6. Compared against a full frame camera, this would be similar to a 23 millimeter lens at f5.6. It's not even really cheap, but using my less expensive kit lens, I cannot match the focal and aperture equivalents 
of the Vivo. All right, so what we gotta do, we gotta step up to my Panasonic 12 to 35 F2.8. This is a $900 lens. Just the lens, $900. All right, the 12 to 35 is installed. When I bought this as a bundle, it was about $2,100. <laughs> I'm utterly gobsmacked because these two are gonna be pretty close. This $2,100 combination of gear when it's wide open at its maximum aperture is kind of like walking around with a full frame camera and a 24 millimeter lens at f5.6. The math is kind of the same. Now, if you've ever done some street photography, full frame at f5.6 is a great balance of isolating your subject and still blurring the background. And we don't have to just crunch the numbers. This isn't hypothetical performance. We can see it in practical application. Shots from the Vivo look very similar to shots from this Lumix. Now, we can absolutely see some of the practical issues at play with smartphone lenses. F1.6 on the Vivo is kind of extreme at the sensor size. So comparing sharpness, flaring, fringing, the Panasonic system has no issues beating the phone lens. You'll see it very clearly on the edges of subjects as you move from the focus point. There's this ghosty border that gets a little bit smeary. When your lens is this big, it's easy to improve on the sharpness and clarity of the final output. It's easy to see why this is $900 worth of glass. It's a really good lens. But the fact that this little phone lens is going toe to toe with this lens and it's not losing by much, that's nothing short of remarkable. If I hold this up and you see me using this, you're going to have a certain expectation of what this can do to craft a more photographic image. If I hold this up, you're going to think, oh, it's a phone. You would not expect the output of this to be similar to this. And that extends into really exciting territory for editing. My Lumix is a cute little champ for still photos. It spits out 23, 24 megabyte raw files for me to edit, and so does the Vivo. They're both in similar territory for data size in RAW photography. Better still, the Vivo can play a few tricks where it stacks RAW files to produce an even higher dynamic range DNG. So the sensor size advantage of the Lumix can basically be matched if there's a situation I can use the super RAW setting on the Vivo. Numerous other quality of life comparisons come into play. A standalone camera is just incredible for focusing the user on one task, maximizing your attention to make the best possible images that you can. From the grip to all of the tactile controls, it's an ergonomic joy. But the size advantage of a phone makes it more discreet. You know, no one blinks when I shoot from a phone where a camera calls way more attention to what I might be doing. And other aspects of content creation also kind of balance out. The Lumix is solid for things like faster shutter speeds. I can get down to 1 8,000th of a second. The Vivo in manual mode can shoot as fast as 1 12,000th of a second. I was originally going to shoot this comparison, you know, being even more fair to the Vivo with my older G85. This can only get down to one four thousandth of a second and it has smaller raw files. And when you can shop a G85, this is still about a $700 camera body. The G9 easily beats the phone for higher quality 4K footage using a less lossy video compression, but the phone has an easier time stabilizing the smaller sensor, especially when you're going handheld. Accessories for mounting a phone are less expensive. Gimbals are faster and less finicky to use. And low light performance is not far off. If we're shooting just normal RAW files, the Lumix still enjoys a slight advantage, but the Vivo includes many ease of use modes. It becomes a little more practical 
than the G9. Low light, auto modes, super bright night modes, and of course that previously mentioned super raw feature stacking multiple raw files on top of each other. Panasonics are great for some of the fun techie stuff. There's a high resolution output option that can really bring some clarity to shots where you might want to create a large format print. And of course, the Vivo lens quality just can't quite match that clarity, even with the full 50 megapixel output from the sensor. But if we're talking about photography, in the moment, take the shot. Standalone cameras aren't quite as capable of matching all the fun HDR and AI options found on our phones. And phones are immediate pocket computers. If I shoot a great RAW photo from my Lumix, I have to transfer it to another computer. If I shoot a great raw image from my Vivo, the camera is the computer that I will use to process and share the image that I just captured. These two are stacking up a lot closer than I would have imagined. But I just keep coming back to the hardware and the math. I've been closely watching phone cameras these last couple years, and it just kind of smacked me in the face how huge these upgrades have really gotten. Looking back, you know, looking back at one of my earlier phone versus camera showdown videos back during the LG G4 era, you know, the G4 had a 28 millimeter equivalent lens, and at f1.8, the equivalent aperture was closer to f12 on a full frame camera. The G4 camera was amazing for 2015. It was incredible seven years ago, but it would have been impossible to pretend that the LG G4 could have filled similar roles as inexpensive DSLRs of the same era. We have evolved significantly since then. Because I can already kind of predict some of the comments I'm gonna get on this video, it's not to sit here and say, we're totally there, you can throw away your mirrorless cameras, phones can get it done. I'm still gonna keep my G9 for my production work. And it's obviously still the better option when I know I need to rely on proper photography tools, plus interchangeable lenses, plus dedicated application of hardware for specific tasks, plus focus, plus battery, storage, et cetera, et cetera. What I need us all to do though, is really push back against lazy reviewing. This video is not a knock on Micro Four Thirds cameras. With OM and Panasonic releasing some new options, Micro Four Thirds is in really good shape for 2022. This video should stand as a celebration of what premium phone cameras can accomplish now. It's ridiculous and kind of sad to keep pretending that this right here isn't capable of some fantastic photographic results, that it's competing directly against professional gear. I'm not grading this on a curve or playing fast and loose with different conditions. You can shoot on this full auto, let the camera do all the work, or you can use it as a fixed lens platform that can get you into some really high level photography. As a photo geek, I can't overstate how awesome that is. And it really bums me out that a lot of folks are gonna miss it. And that's about where I think we should put a pin in this. These conversations never seem to grow out of tiny enthusiast circles because they aren't easily digestible by the algorithm. And my videos, don't really get shared that much. So if you'd like to have some more grown up conversations about maxing out your tech purchases, this kind of content needs your help, you know, sharing it, supporting it, or you can also check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy, where you'd have the additional benefit of getting to hang out with techies who also really want to know what these things can do. You know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, so much on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next comparison.